Before I get going here, I need to give a shout out to Erin from Northwest Indiana. She recently signed up to be a Patreon of the show, and so not only will she be listening to this episode a few days earlier than its official release, she is also owed this particular shout out. Erin, thank you so much. I continue to be amazed that people find my voice tolerable to listen to. To learn more about the show's Patreon page, visit patreon.com slash writteninbloodhistory. I'm recording this episode exactly 40 years to the day after the events I'm about to describe. I have, for as long as I can remember, been somewhat obsessed with tornadoes. And so, likewise, I've long been familiar with what happened in Grand Island, Nebraska. When I began to research if there was enough material to use for the show, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the 40th anniversary of that night was just around the corner. And so, it was officially added to the lineup. Despite my aforementioned obsession, I likewise acknowledge that tornadoes are probably the most terrifying force of nature in existence. They can upend people's lives in just a few seconds. And so I think it's important that I curb my fascination with a recognition of the terrible reality that was experienced to the fullest by the people of Grand Island. And so, I'd like to dedicate this episode to the people of that city, especially those who were there on that horrible night, to the heroes and the first responders, as well as the ordinary citizens who risked their lives for their neighbors. All who, mere hours after the last tornado lifted, immediately began the sorrowful process of rebuilding their city. All of you have within you a bravery that I cannot fathom. And it's my hope that I have done justice to your deeds and kept the memory of that night alive in this almost episode called Supercell over Grand Island. The weather forecast for Grand Island, Nebraska on the night of Tuesday, June 3rd, 1980 called for moderate seasonal weather, some humidity, and a 20% chance of thunderstorms. Across the Midwest, the previous night had seen some unusually violent weather. Tornadoes had touched down in Ohio, Indiana, Iowa, and even as far away as Pennsylvania, Maryland, and West Virginia. But with such a small chance of storms in Grand Island on this night, everyone went about their business as usual. This city in central Nebraska was founded by German pioneers working their way west around the middle of the 19th century. And they were hardy souls, enduring all the hardships associated with that trailblazing generation. The early settlement became known as Grand Island due to its placement between two rivers, the Wood and the Platte. For those headed west of the growing town, Grand Island was one of the last stopovers before crossing the Great Plains of America. By 1980... Grand Island had a population of over 30,000 people. The Great Plains can sometimes go by another name, Tornado Alley. Here, the warm, humid air from the equator and the cold, dry air from Canada and the Rockies clash in what is often a violent tumult of updrafts and downdrafts. This landscape of unbroken horizons and so flat and immense, it's the perfect proving ground for Mother Nature to try out all of her most awe-inspiring atmospheric experiments. Pulse storms, or single-cell storms, are those magnificent, towering, fluffy, cumulonimbus cloud formations that can bring down heavy downdrafts and torrential rain in short bursts, hence their name. Multi-cell storms are pulse storms that rumble over each other in clusters, and as one rises and wreaks havoc and dies, another from behind overtakes it and rises anew. And they go on like that until the entire system runs out of steam. Sometimes these cells organize into a squall line. We've all seen this on the radar maps. A foreboding line of storms, hundreds of miles long, bulldozing across the landscape, bringing brief but heavy winds and rain. But by far, the most destructive storm is the supercell. You know you're looking at a supercell when you see a single, monstrous, anvil-shaped gray, white, and black tower in the distance. Hail, persistent torrential rains, huge downdrafts are their hallmarks, and sometimes, about 30% of the time, you get tornadoes. Supercells are rotating storms. They have inside them a massive spinning core anywhere from 2 to 6 miles wide called a mesocyclone. The rotation of the mesocyclone, which is like the centrifuge for the entire mass, 
is fed, or better yet, it feeds off the warm air on the surface of the Earth. That warm air is sucked up in a spiraling pattern into the twirling core and then spewed out into the atmosphere above. The cold air from the atmosphere then hurtles down towards the Earth in the absence of the warm air below. This falling cool air cascading down the sides of the storm is what carves out its mesmerizing anvil shape. The tops of these storms, the anvil shelves that loom over its path, can reach upwards of 70,000 feet. That's twice the height of a typical commercial airliner. And so with the warm air vacuuming up and the cool air crashing down, the supercell rolls along the landscape, often leaving terrible destruction in its path. To understand how tornadoes form in these storms, you have to imagine something like a positive loop gain or feedback effect in a microphone. Sometimes that mesocyclone at the center of the supercell becomes so powerful that it can pull back in the cool air falling back to Earth. And this denser, cooler air violently collides underneath the center of the storm before being sucked back up. The intensity of the mesocyclone, which could be six miles wide, becomes laser focused into just a few hundred feet. The rapid and sudden influx of cool air from the outside of the mesocyclone can be detected on radar as a formation known as a hook echo. The force of this suction condenses the moisture and the dust and the debris into the most recognizable and archetypal manifestation of nature's wrath, the tornado. Despite the forecast of 20% chance of thunderstorms on this particular Tuesday evening in June, Don Davis of the National Weather Service, at around 8.30 p.m., began tracking the growing supercell formation that was amassing into a 10-mile-wide rotating fury, looking very much like a hurricane on radar. The Weather Service's radar scope can scan as high as 60,000 feet, but they couldn't see the top of this storm. Don later recalled that he'd never seen anything like it before. This supercell had another strange menacing feature. It was moving slow, really, really slow, sometimes as slow as 5 miles per hour. Just before 9 p.m., as this storm was rolling into Grand Island, the Doppler detected a hook echo. Deputy Kelly Buck had pulled over on a highway helping some people who were having car trouble. The twilight June sky was fading to black under the shadow of the supercell. As he was loading up people into the vehicle, the first tornado of the night showed its face. Deputy Buck's car was suddenly caught up in the incredible force, and the wind was dragging him across the highway as the tornado beckoned him towards the mesocyclone. Deputy Buck slammed on the brake pedal, but to no avail. The suction was so strong that it ripped the officer's rear window out of the car. But Deputy Buck was lucky, and the people he was helping were lucky too, as the tornado let them be. Unfortunately, another woman wasn't so lucky. She died driving to a relative's house, caught in the path of this monster. Receiving a 911 call that a house had collapsed on a family, Deputy Greg Allers and another officer left to go see what help, if any, they could offer. But on their way, they nearly ran into this twister tearing up the northwest side of town. Their car lifted into the air and slammed back down to the road. And then again, and again, and again. Quote, We never made it there. As the car was skipping along, I thought we were driving into the tornado. I thought that one time we were not going to come back down. Once the car came to a stop, we turned around and came back to town. End quote. Everything was happening so suddenly that the severity of the situation hadn't yet sunk into the town, especially for the first responders. Firefighters, without thinking twice, left the station to answer the calls of potential fires. One account tells of a 60-foot tree slamming into a fire truck and another car with a mother and a baby inside. The firefighters pulled the mother and the child from their car and then took shelter in a nearby basement. Another account tells of one of Grand Island's fire engines actually being lifted off the ground and dropped into the next lane over. Don Haddix was a TV reporter who rented an apartment on the 11th floor of the tallest building in Grand Island. When he got home on this evening, he opened up his curtains just in time to see the tornado entering the city. Quote, It was a big, menacing thing. It also was the scariest thing I'd ever seen. It roared through town and tore it apart. I saw it work its way right into town. I thought I'd call the weather guy at the station, but then the electricity went out. So I sat and watched this thing. It got darker and darker. I got my camera out, and then the storm system moved to the north of the city. I could see lightning. The sky was quite a show. The funnel was moving straight towards the town. I'd never seen a tornado in my life, but I was in the middle of one. Then I looked to my right, and I saw another twister from the northeast. End quote. Don recalls seeing more and more funnel clouds drop from the sky and then rise again like yo-yos over and over, as if teasing and taunting the terrified city below. 
He finally made the decision to flee his apartment building and find shelter. Quote, I got out the door and a gust of wind lifted me right up into the air. If I hadn't held on to the door handle, I would have been flown to City Hall or beyond. I ran the 50 yards or so to City Hall. It was so dark by this time I couldn't see. There was a tremendous roar outside. It was absolutely overwhelming. End quote. By 9 p.m., these two tornadoes were simultaneously tearing apart northern Grand Island. The first one was just under a half a mile wide and was later declared an F3, meaning that it had wind speeds of up to 165 miles per hour, heavy enough to lift rail cars. The second tornado that touched down was weaker. It was an F1, but still powerful enough to make your home look like Swiss cheese. It was extraordinarily unique, however. It was an anticyclonic tornado. In the northern hemisphere, 99% of tornadoes rotate counterclockwise. But this second tornado was spinning clockwise. At 9.05, a third tornado, a quarter of a mile wide and later labeled an F3, dropped down just on the northeast border of the city. It was also an anticyclonic tornado. At first, it headed north into farmland, but suddenly made a 180 back to town, slamming into a high school and a veterans hospital. For seven hellish minutes, three tornadoes were on the ground in Grand Island. Firefighter Tom Fisher was driving his pickup truck on Capitol Avenue and recalled that he felt like he was floating in an ocean as trees and debris hovered all around him, defying gravity. Fisher decided that to go on was suicide, so he stopped his truck and hunkered down to the floor for protection. Quote, I just laid there and prayed. The truck was rocking and everything was shaking. End quote. The twister tossed his pickup truck into the air like a child's toy, and Tom smashed his face on the ceiling as shards of glass tore into him. When the tornado moved on to other prey, Tom crawled out of his truck window, brushed himself off, and began to search house to house for others who may be in need. County Sheriff Emmett Arnett remembers one of his officers shouting over the radio, quote, There's one chasing me down Capitol Avenue. I can see the fire as the tornado hits the wires, end quote. At 9.12 p.m., tornado number two goes back up into the sky. At 9.30 p.m., tornado number three likewise retracts back up. At 9.34, the first tornado, after twisting and looping on an irregular path for over 14 miles in a continuous 49 minutes, disappeared into the massive supercell over Grand Island. Hundreds of people were hurt, dozens of buildings were leveled, and no one had any idea how many people might still be trapped or dead under the rubble. At 9.46, a fourth tornado touches down. It's another anticyclonic, and it swings up from the farm country in the southeast into the border of the city for two and a half miles before dissipating. It would later be labeled an F1. At 10.16, a monster of a tornado touches down just east of Grand Island and heads straight for the city. As it approached the city limits, it grows to over half a mile wide and slams into residential districts, chewing up everything in its path. Ray and Nancy Gearhart heard the tornado alarm, so they grabbed their eight-year-old daughter, Kimberly, and dashed for their cellar. The air pressure was fluctuating drastically, causing their eardrums to continuously pop while everything above them was smashing and cracking and shattering. Kathy Creeman remembers, quote, I saw trees fall before my eyes right through the front door. I don't know how many Hail Marys in our fathers, I said, end quote. Officer Russell was on duty at the emergency room, and he could hear the terror emanating from his two-way. Quote, I remember hearing screaming over the radio that houses were blowing away. They were talking about houses exploding around them. You could hear the stress and edge in their voices. End quote. Tammy Malone was home alone and in labor while her husband was at work. Remember, this is before cell phones. She amazingly made it to the hospital by driving herself before the supercell hit, and her husband, fortunately, was able to make it there too. When the first tornado hit, she was moved into the basement, and windows began shattering all around her and all the people taking shelter in the hospital dungeon. One nurse was slammed against the wall from the winds. On the other side of town, tornado number five was ripping through her neighborhood. It completely leveled her house and flooded her basement. Going into labor may have saved her life and her daughter Amber's life, who was born at 1.20 a.m. that very night. After obliterating the residential district, tornado number five began to turn south toward the business district. Its first victim was the bowling alley. People standing in the parking lot watching the storm saw funnel clouds drop and raise over and over again. Three were seen to touch down and converge back into one massive tornado. Carrie Ball recalls, quote, They ran in and yelled that it was coming this way. There wasn't time to do anything else, so I dove into the bathroom, end quote. Then, 
The power shut off, leaving those stranded inside in complete darkness with the roar of the terrible beast outside. Carrie grabbed onto a pipe under a sink and held on for dear life. Others did likewise. As the tornado rolled over the bowling alley, the walls began to disintegrate, and then the ceiling started caving in. A steel beam was about to fall on another woman, but it was miraculously caught by a man she didn't know. Carrie decided to open her eyes, but all was black. The wind howled and whistled, and metal could be heard bending and clanking. Glass, wood, bricks, everything was being turned upside down, but she could see none of it. Quote, I remember people praying and saying Hail Marys. We were all afraid we were going to die. End quote. But the tornado moved on just as quickly as it had arrived. And when the survivors clawed their way out of the rubble, there was a car sitting on the bowling lanes. And the liquor bottles were still standing unmoved on the bar, strangely untouched by the fury of Mother Nature while all else was desolate. After the bowling alley, this massive tornado, later to be classified as an F4, demolished a lounge, smashed into a Kmart and a school before spinning out into the rural farmhouses where it did more damage to barns and homes. But before it exhausted itself, tornado number six fell from the sky almost right next to the F4 that had just torn up the bowling alley. Together, these twisters ripped into the rural residences of Grand Island Southeast. By 1035, they were both exhausted. The supercell over Grand Island had nearly stopped over the city, but it was not finally passing. And yet, before it passed completely, it sent one more tornado down just for good measure. It landed in the far southeast and mostly did damage to fields. It was almost an insult to injury at this point. And at 11.30, this last tornado was gone, and the supercell over Grand Island had moved on. Police Captain Dan Poole, who was on the lookout for more funnel clouds, said, quote, this was the first time I'd ever seen Grand Island black. It was spooky. We had six flat tires on police cars through that whole night. It was a night of horror. We had hundreds of reports of people trapped. We checked every tip with a lot of volunteer help. There was so much adrenaline running in our veins. We made a lot of runs to the hospital. End quote. After three hours of howling hell, Grand Island lay in ruins. Debris was everywhere. Cars were just gone. Commercial buildings were shredded. Old and ancient trees were uprooted with cracked limbs strewn about. People, families, and neighbors gathered together, wrapped in blankets, outside the bent and contorted remains of their homes and their memories. How many Sunday brunches had occurred in those homes? How many infants' first steps were cheered on by proud parents? And how many graduates had these roofs given shelter to? And how many Christmases and birthdays and funeral wakes? And how many fireside chats into the late hours of the night? How could the sun ever rise again for these people? For when it did, it brought to light an incredible devastation. Nonetheless, the search and rescue operations were well underway, and help from all over Nebraska was pouring into the city. Families and elderly were pulled from basements and cellars. Firefighters and police officers zipped around the city, transporting people to the hospital and shutting off gas lines. In spite of the immense damage done to the VA hospital, the health care workers there made sure that their patients had warm eggs for breakfast. The city was soon declared a disaster area, allowing for FEMA to come in with its resources. And in a moment of old-fashioned Midwest pride for some of the residents, now remembered by plaques and stone engravings, President Jimmy Carter paid a visit to Grand Island. And his calm, down-to-earth demeanor carried with it an air of authentic affection and sympathy for the hardy folk of Grand Island. FEMA estimated 50 businesses were destroyed, along with 700 other structures. 2,000 homes suffered damage, and 1,000 homes were completely obliterated. When adjusted for inflation, nearly a billion dollars worth of damage was done. 200 people were injured, and many seriously. And perhaps what is by far the most amazing figure of the entire event is the mortality rate. Only five people died. And those deaths are all tragic, especially for their grieving families. But for seven tornadoes to descend on a single town and only claim five lives is nothing short of miraculous. The weather-related scientific community was also deeply interested in the supercell that parked over Grand Island for three hours. First of all, these storms just typically don't move that slow. Secondly, like I said earlier, anticyclonic tornadoes are rare, less than 1%. Grand Island just had three in one night. The most renowned tornado researcher around, Dr. Ted Fujita, for whom the Fujita scale of rating tornadoes is named after, he said he'd never seen anything like what happened in Grand Island. 
on Thursday, June 5th, two days after the night of the Twisters in Grand Island. Local newspaper editor Al Schmall wrote a piece dedicated to the people of his city, and he closed with the following lines, quote, Yes, Grand Island lies devastated, but it is not dead. It began proving that Tuesday night before the funnel clouds, which seemed to hover over the city for hours and moved on. It proved it through the rest of the nighttime hours and through a day Wednesday that will be etched forever in the minds of all who are here. The city is alive and kicking today, and the pioneers who built it could hardly have had more spirit. This Night in Grand Island was written into a semi-fictionalized young adult novel called Night of the Twisters by Ivy Ruckman. I've never read it, but I did see the made-for-TV movie uh, by the same title in the mid-90s. And it was pretty good. It's a little cheesy, but I tend to like cheesy. If you want to learn more about these events, the local paper in Grand Island, The Independent, has a fantastic archive of all the news articles from the days following. It's really good stuff that I recommend checking out if you're interested. You can find that at GITwisters.com, and I'll make sure there's a link to it uh, in the show notes after I post the episode. If you did enjoy this episode and you found it worthy of a dollar, I would definitely appreciate that dollar. The History Show has a few costs associated with it, such as hosting and web fees, as well as purchasing research material. And so if you go to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash writteninbloodhistory, you can sign up for a buck a month to support the show. You also get some behind-the-scenes access to research material, as well as a shout-out on the next episode that I record. For those of you who are already patrons, I am forever in your debt. Another huge way you can help me out is by leaving a rating or review on wherever you listen to this podcast. These are critical and organic exposure, and perhaps equally important, I know this from talking with other podcasters, a nice review is the fuel that fires us. It just makes our day. If you want to get a hold of me, you can go to the Written in Blood Facebook page, or my Twitter handle is at sdejulius. You can also send me an email at stephen.dejulius at gmail.com. And as always... From the bottom of my heart, thank you for listening to Written in Blood History. See you later.